The Fifth Elegy, dedicated to Frau Hertha Kunig. But tell me, who are they, these wanderers, even more transient than we ourselves, who from their earliest days are savagely wrung out by a never-satisfied will? For whose sake? Yet it wrings them, bends them, twists them, swings them and flings them and catches them again, and falling as if through oiled slippery air, they land on the threadbare carpet, worn constantly thinner by their perpetual leaping. This carpet, that is lost in infinite space, stuck on like a bandage, as if the suburban sky had wounded the earth. And hardly has it appeared when, standing there upright, is the large capital D that begins duration, and the always approaching grip takes them again as a joke, even the strongest men, and crushes them the way King Augustus the Strong would crush a pewter plate. Ah, and around this center the rose of onlooking blooms and unblossoms. Around this pestle pounding the carpet, this pistol fertilized by the pollen of its own dust, and producing in turn the specious fruit of displeasure, the unconscious gaping faces, their thin surfaces glossy with boredom's specious half-smile. There the shriveled-up, wrinkled weightlifter, an old man who only drums now, shrunk in his enormous skin which looks as if it had once contained two men, and the other were already lying in the graveyard while this one lived on without him, deaf and sometimes a little confused in the widowed skin. And the young one over there, the man who might be the son of a neck and a nun, firm and vigorously filled with muscles and innocence. Children, whom a grief that was still quite small once received as a toy during one of its long convalescence. You little boy who fall down a hundred times daily with the thud that only unripe fruits know from the tree of mutually constructed motion, which more quickly than water in a few minutes has its spring, summer, and autumn, fall down hard on the grave. Sometimes, during brief pauses, a loving look toward your seldom affectionate mother tries to be born in your expression, but it gets lost along the way. Your body consumes it, that timid, scarcely attempted face, and again the man is clapping his hands for your leap, and before a pain can become more distinct near your constantly racing heart, the stinging in your souls rushes ahead of that other pain, chasing a pair of physical tears quickly into your eyes, and nevertheless, blindly, the smile. O oh, gather it, angel, that small-flowered herb of healing, create a vase and preserve it, Set it among those joys not yet open to us. On that lovely urn, praise it with the ornately flowing inscription, Subricio Saltat. And you then, my lovely darling, you whom the most tempting joys have mutely leapt over, perhaps your fringes are happy for you, or perhaps the green metallic silk stretched over your firm young breasts feels itself endlessly indulged and in need of nothing. You display fruit of equanimity, set out in front of the public, in continual variations on all the swaying scales of equipoise lifted among the shoulders. Oh, where is the place? I carry it in my heart, where they still were far from mastery, still fell apart from each other, like mating cattle that someone has badly paired, where the weights are still heavy, where from their vainly twirling sticks the plates still wobble and drop. And suddenly, in this laborious nowhere, suddenly the unsayable spot where the pure too little is transformed incomprehensibly leaps around and changes into that empty too much where the difficult calculation becomes numberless and resolved. Squares, O oh square in Paris, infinite showplace where the milliner Madame Lamour twists and winds the restless paths of the earth, those endless ribbons, and from them, designs new bows, frills, flowers, ruffles, artificial fruits, all falsely colored for the cheap winter bonnets of fate. Angel, if there were a place that we didn't know of, and there, on some unsayable carpet, lovers displayed what they never could bring to mastery here, the bold exploits of their high-flying hearts, their towers of pleasure, 
their ladders that have long since been standing where there was no ground, leaning just on each other, trembling, and could master all this before the surrounding spectators, the innumerable, soundless dead. Would these, then, throw down their final, forever saved up, forever hidden, unknown to us, eternally valid coins of happiness before the at last genuinely smiling pair on the gratified carpet? <laughs>